perfect. All right, so as you know, we are recording this session and oops, and I want to thank you for coming today to our kind of inaugural EdCamp, a virtual version of EdCamp. There is a version of EdCamp that actually is in person, but obviously we're not able to do that right now. Um, so I do want to thank you for coming today to our virtual version. It is like a mini conference, so you will be able to go to, um, be able to choose from a variety of sessions each hour after this short opening session. And um, if you are attending and needing to earn hours, as stated in PL, you will have to remain in each session for a majority of the time in order to earn hours for that session. So um, for the hour long sessions that come after this, for example, you'll need to be in that session for 45 minutes. Okay, so we are going to get started. Welcome to all of you who are just now joining us and to those of you who hopped on early just to make sure your tech was working and everything was good. Um, my name is Nicole Naditz, so I'll be starting off with this opening session. And then if you go back to that spreadsheet that you opened up that got you the link to this today, you'll find all of the links that you'll need for the sessions you might be choosing to attend starting at 8.30. Um, so I know that there are still some people hopping into the room, but I am going to get, I'm going to get us started. And so the, the bit that I'll be doing today is shorter. It's just a half hour opening session and we're going to be looking at putting the learning in distance learning. And um, there is a bit of interactivity involved, but because we are a large group, we're going to use the chat feature primarily for that interactivity just to make sure I don't go over time because I need to make sure you have time to get to your next session at the end. So we're actually going to start with an activity um, for you to do in the chat, please. We'll give you about a minute and a half to two minutes. What are the characteristics of the best lessons you have ever seen, or it could be lessons you taught yourself, right? So this is not at all limited to distance learning. This is any lesson you have ever seen um, or lesson that you have taught. What were the characteristics that made it rise to the top in your memory as one of the best lessons that you have seen. I was muted. You can definitely feel free to second what someone else says in the chat if you would like to as well, but I encourage you to kind of take a roll through the chat right now. We have a lot of people who have noted some things that made that made lessons rise to the top in terms of the um, being some of the best lessons you've seen or experienced or taught yourselves. Engagement comes up multiple times. Interactive personal application of the content. Um, interest and engagement, again, coming up a lot. Um, specific strategies to promote accessibility of the content for every learner. Also noticing in addition to engagement and um, so on that, it, that it's meaningful to them, that it's meaningful to the learners. Um, and I wanna call out something else I'm seeing, which is that sense of that it's not just the teacher involved and kind of providing and putting all the energy into the room, but that there's a balance between teacher and student interactions, student to student interactions and so on. Sorry, I'm quickly reading through these myself. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing engagement and interaction coming up a lot. Um, and then someone mentioned like a discovery lesson or inquiry based learning in which the students are engaged in posing questions and seeking answers and kind of driving their own learning through the exploration and inquiry that they engage in. Absolutely. 
I'm going to have to go faster. There's 33 new messages. <laughs> Welcome to those of you who are just joining us. You can feel th free to hop into the chat for this first activity. We will be moving on from this first activity um, in a moment, but uh, we're just now getting started and this session is being recorded. The link to all the recordings will be posted in the spreadsheet for you. And so yes, teacher passion is important, right? We, we know it, even students know it. If teachers are passionate about what they're teaching and excited by the content, that actually does really go a long ways towards supporting learners. Mm -hmm. Prior knowledge, thank you, yeah. And that, so I think one of the comments, you know, talking about triggering prior knowledge is that one of the things that can make a lesson successful is that there's a purposeful moment in the lesson at the beginning where we actually reactivate any prior knowledge or skills or experiences that are kind of going to lay a framework um, in the students, you know, neural connections and so on to kind of bring back content skills information that the students are going to need in order to be successful. Right. So let me do one more thing here before I forget because I almost forgot. There we go. All right, so you will see that there are captions available. Um, it is automatic and there's no chance for correction. So there could be some errors, but um, in case this is helpful to anybody, there will be captions visible. Thank you so much for participating in that. I want you to kind of keep all of those things in mind as we go forward, because I think you're going to find that a lot of what you said in this first activity is going to be brought back out in the work that we're doing today in this opening session. So one of the things that we as educators have come to realize is that there's a lot to teaching in order for knowledge and skills to develop among our learners in a way that they own it, it's not enough to have separate bits of knowledge that are disconnected. We have to connect the dots. We have to prepare learners for work that goes beyond mere isolated bits of knowledge. And even to a certain extent, as we see now, as we're preparing learners for what they are going to be doing um, beyond our courses and as they move on in their trajectory in life, that we need, we need to even provide opportunities for them to go beyond those connected learned experiences in order to engage in work that depends on nuance and posing new problems or posing problems in different ways and exploring previously unconsidered solutions. Um, we want students to have opportunities to engage in work that depends on human connection. And that's one of the things we might be struggling with right now for example, as we try to navigate distance learning, even if in this fall we, you know, might, we don't know what model we will have exactly yet, but there might be some days in which students are engaged in distance learning and we want them to really further their growth and their knowledge, not just in isolation, but on human connection. And we want to engage them in work that really relies on that infinite human capacity and infinite human creativity. So one of the frameworks we can consider as we are designing learning experiences are what are called high leverage teaching practices. And there's an important distinction between high leverage teaching practices and what a lot of people refer to as best practices. Best practices tend to happen in isolation. They get called out and recognized and so on, but they aren't, they aren't typically the, what one expects to see in every single class, best practices are, are not necessarily the norm. They are something that occurs, as I said a second ago, more in isolation. High leverage teaching practices are different. They're really core practices. They are instructional moves and strategies and supports that are necessary for learning to occur. Welcome, thank you for joining us. But that does mean that if that's true, these are practices that, for example, credentialing programs around the country are trying to develop and foster in their teaching credential candidates because they are practices that we want to see in all classrooms and in all learning experiences, regardless of where those experiences are occurring. They are not specific to a grade level or a subject area. Um, as you'll see in a moment, I'll show you an example 
um, of some. There are a lot of different ideas or lists available of high leverage teaching practices, but we will be talking a little bit about those first, and then we're going to connect those to distance learning and see what kinds of connections we can draw. So I adapted a very large list of um, high leverage teaching practices from a group called Teaching Works at the University of Michigan. And um, one of the things that I did was I actually took, they had, I can't remember now if it was like 19 or 22 high leverage teaching practices, but they actually, they just listed them all in individual items. And I actually see some connections between them. For example, one of the high leverage teaching practices is building respectful relationships with students. And a lot of the ways that educators might go about doing that are actually listed as additional high leverage teaching practices by teaching works. For example, one of the teaching practices that I felt goes within this building respectful relationships with students is learning about students, cultural, religious, family, intellectual, and personal experiences and resources for use in instruction. Another high leverage teaching practice that is connected to this high leverage teaching practice of building respectful relationships with students is specifying and reinforcing productive student behaviors. Another one is implementing norms and routines for classroom discourse and work. And I, I feel like that one is one that we're all thinking about as we try to imagine what the return to school might be like and, and what it will look like to implement norms and routines, um, given that we may be starting the year for at least some students starting initially outside of the classroom as opposed to inside of the classroom. Um, and those norms and routines act for classroom discourse really do go back to building respectful relationships with students. And to be honest, I'd actually edit this particular HLTP to say with and among students and others, um, because one of the things we're finding or that at least I think became evident to a lot of teachers as we all moved into distance learning this spring is that we do have a fairly high percentage of learners, and I don't just mean in our district, but in a lot of places, that need um, additional support in order to engage meaningfully, productively, and respectfully in dynamic online spaces where there is opportunity for communication with each other from behind a screen. Um, and then another kind of high leverage teaching practice from their list that I set up as kind of a category is setting long and short term learning goals for students. Um, and we know that that's going to continue to be critically important and that a lot of educators, and I'm sure some of you included, are really thinking about um, what that might look like. Does there need to be any adjustment to the goals given that we may not be returning to a situation where we have our students in our class with us five days a week um, or at least whatever our normal schedule was with students on campus and what impact will that have on the goals and if that does impact the amount of goals we can try to approach in this year, how do we select the goals that they that themselves are the most high leverage goals to get the most mileage for students both in success in this year's content as well as going forward another kind of big idea in the high leverage teaching practices list is designing single lessons and sequences of lessons what does that look like in distance or blended learning um, how do we explain and model content processes and strategies which is another one of the high leverage teaching practices from teaching works um, how can we check student understanding during the lesson and at the conclusion of lessons? What about eliciting and interpreting individual students' thinking? What can we do in distance learning, for example, maybe building on the, on the practices that we use within our, um, within our normal day-to-day -day instruction to really bring students' thoughts and questions and ideas and explorations and inquiries into the learning space, whether that learning space is in our rooms or digital. How can we lead group discussions, for example? How can we set up and manage small group work? The, and interesting, you know, I, 
it's difficult to answer all these questions. There's no one answer that's going to work for each teacher in their settings and for all of their learners. But they are questions that I know I'm thinking about as I look at what fall might look like. Selecting and designing formal assessments of student learning and providing oral and written feedback to students. What aspects of distance learning make that easier? What are some of the challenges that we might be facing as we look at distance learning? And then the last one um, that I kind of pulled out, oh no, sorry, there's one more, <laughs> almost last one that I pulled out from their big list of, like I said, somewhere around 22 high leverage teaching practices, analyzing instruction for the purposes of improving it, including coordinating and adjusting instruction during a lesson and interpreting the results of student work after a lesson in order to make some instructional decisions and moves going forward. And then of course we do have to communicate. We need to talk about students and, and communicate how they're doing, where their strengths are, where their challenges are, and how can we leverage the technologies that we have and the platforms we have in place and our other tools both in cam on campus and off campus in order to provide parents and families with useful and accurate information about how students are doing particularly their strengths as well as challenges. So one of the things we're going to be doing um, is, and I put the link to the full list in the slide deck, this slide deck is actually linked in already in the spreadsheet so you don't have to worry about how you, the slide deck, I've already linked it there for you. But now I'd like you to go back into the chat. And so again, I pulled out a few of the high leverage teaching practices that Teaching Works identified. And as I was talking, I was actually including some additional ones. Um, but my question for you now is, what connections do you already see between these high leverage teaching practices, which were and have been by multiple organizations developed and shared prior to this massive pivot that we all made towards distance learning? What connections do you see between those and the learning experiences that you already have been designing, not just this past spring, but even prior to that, so you can consider it in both ways. So take another minute or two in the chat to just type some connections that you see. I am definitely seeing a pattern developing in the responses regarding family engagement. Yes, of course, I'll repeat the question. And I hope it's not blocked for you. I'm hoping my tools aren't in your way. Um, basically, in the chat, what connections do you see just for yourself between these high leverage teaching practices and the learning experiences that you design? And so some are finding it easy. They're just able to say, hey, this is one of the high leverage teaching practices that I already know I'm strong in and they just listed and others are providing additional, um, additional detail. Nice. What's interesting is you scroll through, you'll actually find that virtually every one of these, again, in my opinion, I pulled these out of their massive list as kind of even bigger kind of umbrella concepts under which I thought some of the other HLTP also fit. Um, you'll find almost everyone in this list is actually in your responses. And I think that kind of goes back to the idea that these are features of instruction that need to happen and that, that as educators, we continue to develop our skill in doing these things as we design learning experiences for our students. But I definitely do see a, a strong kind of pattern towards, in particular, 
um, number one, building successful relationships with students. I guess I'm finding it interesting to scroll through because all of them. And I do appreciate the comment from Alma, you know, it was helpful to use the relationships that we had built when we moved into distance learning. And I know a lot of us are really thinking about what does that look like in the fall with a new group of students where we might not have the benefit of having already built these relationships before going into a distance learning environment. I'm doing a lot of reading and collecting right now because I'm going to say I really don't have the answers to all of those questions because I'm still kind of wrapping my head around that myself. Like, what would it look like if we end up returning to school with some students, if not distance learning five days a week, we might still very likely have students doing distance learning three days a week. And if they're not all coming to campus on the first two days of school, that means some students are theoretically starting school in a distance learning model. What does that look like and how is it different, right? So what we're going to have moved to now is kind of building the bridge between the high leverage teaching practices and distance learning. And it looks like I reversed my animation, which is too bad because that's going to happen now on every one of the next several slides. Um, but build respectful relationships with students. What might that look like in distance learning? So I noticed in our schedule, by the way, I hope you noticed too, we do actually have some, um, a session, at least one, on social emotional learning strategies and support. So if this is something that is of interest to you, you can pursue that in one of the sessions later today. But you, you know, can we embed those strategies through both synchronous and asynchronous learning? So let's say we go back with some kind of blended model where you're, you have students on campus a couple days a week and they're doing distance learning the other three days. Um, obviously there are things you're going to put in place on the days they're on campus with you if we're able to have those. But what about when they're not on campus? Can we embed some social emotional supports through the synchronous work we do if there is any of that? For example, in full-time distance learning, there would be synchronous learning as well as well as through the asynchronous learning that they do on their own anytime whenever they have access to their devices. What can we do to invite learners' voices into the digital learning spaces? Um, what can we do to ensure that we are being transparent? Because that also is part of respect too, right? Making sure everyone has the information they need in a way that they can understand it. So what can we do to be transparent in, learn, in communicating the learning targets for our students for this short term as well as long term? any policies we have in place, grades, and how grades are derived and, and determined, and so on. Um, and as we look at that, we're going to look at being deliberate about trying to understand the cultural norms for communicating and collaborating um, in that prevail in particular communities, because we know that can have an impact on how well those relationships are fostered. Um, we're going to look at specifying and reinforcing productive student behavior. So we might use built-in features of our core technology tools to help learners exhibit good digital citizenship. And when necessary, to temporarily restrict access if some students are showing they're not ready to have open access to the question feature in Google Classroom, for example. But we can work with those students individually and help bring them to a point where they can return to participating in those activities meaningfully and productively and respectfully. Um, and then that too is also where we're going to implement some norms and routines. The uh, next one that was setting long and short term learning goals for students as just a broad high leverage teaching practice for all learning most of the time occurring, occurring in brick and mortar classrooms. Um, we can use our distance learning platforms to communicate those short and long term learning targets clearly and to communicate them consistently and in a routine fashion so that they always you know, appear in the same way or at the same time, or we always know that, that this, my, this teacher will always post the learning targets for the week on Monday and they will always be in this spot in this way and here's how you'll access them. Um, communicating could be a weekly announcement in Google Classroom or Seesaw or the first slide in every slide deck if you are using slide decks to help deliver content, for example. And then we can also use available technology to engage learners in self-assessing on those learning goals, how they're doing, and on reflecting on their progress towards those learning targets and where they see themselves as kind of, I got this without help, I can only do this with help, um, and I can't do this yet, 
and they can keep monitoring and reflecting and self-assessing. So we can use tools like Google Forms, um, the question assignment in Google Classroom, or a quick write, quick draw, and so on in Seesaw. All right, so give me a second. I'm gonna have to move us along. Designing single lessons and sequences of lessons. So connect new learning to previous learning. Um, leverage core technologies for instruction and practice. And one important piece that I forgot to add here on the slide would also be to design learning in such a way that it is designed to support every learner to be successful. So putting in, for example, um, audio support to go with the text, images to support text, and um, other features and things that we can do to make sure we support every single learner. We want to elicit and interpret their thinking by using our technology tools in distance learning to pose questions aligned to learning targets that reveal their thinking about the content. And obviously we are going to continue to need to select and design formal assessments of student learning. We want those to be based on learning targets, authentic and meaningful, and then if we have any model of distance learning happening, how can we use technology to administer certain assessments? How can we use technology to monitor assessments? How can we use technology to provide feedback? Um, and then we can reflect on our lessons. And interestingly, we're doing a lot more recording of lessons now, so we can actually watch our own recordings and kind of reflect on our own work, as well as analyzing student work in the ways we might have traditionally done prior to moving to distance learning, okay? Um, and so do definitely develop, consider developing and sharing your communication plan. Will there be office hours? Would be available by email during which hours? Be clear that you're not doing email all day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, how can you use technology to collect access and share relevant information? So I need to let you go. I almost made it. Um, I need to let you go to your next session. Please head back to the spreadsheet. You will find this slide deck there. You will also find the evaluation form for this short opening session. Um, and you will find all the links you need to join up with the presenters or facilitators of your choice for the rest of the day. I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you so much for choosing to take this time today to engage in this learning. And I'm really pleased that so many of our teachers um, and practitioners across the district. This is all led by the practitioners across the district. So I'm really grateful to each and every one of them for sharing their experiences with all of us. Have a great day, everybody.